Hello, I'm John Sapansky. I'm with the Department of Justice Training and Standards Bureau. We have come together today to hear about problem-oriented policing with law professor emeritus Herman Goldstein of the UW-Madison. It is indeed a pleasure to have this opportunity to hear from someone so committed to developing a form of policing that is effective and also committed to maintaining and extending democratic values. Herman joined the UW faculty in 1964 with the Ford Foundation grant to integrate research and teaching relating to the police within the context of a law school. When he wrote the book Problem-Oriented Policing in 1990, he conceptualized a radical new form of policing designed to increase police effectiveness while at the same time refining the use of police authority. Most recent works have dealt with the development of the concept and relating it to other concepts such as community policing. We are also pleased to have with us a panel of police officers who will be directing their questions to Professor Goldstein. First, we have Officer Denise Miller from the Fitchburg Police Department. Second is Officer Theo Darden from the University of Wisconsin Police Department. And third, Deputy Mark Bulett from the Racine County Sheriff's Department. Let's begin with our first question, Theo. Professor Goldstein, I've heard the terms community-oriented policing, problem-oriented policing, community-oriented policing and problem-solving, community problem-solving and oriented policing. Are these all variations of the same thing? Uh, and there are many more, uh, Theo. I, I, I can understand some of the confusion that is out there. Uh, this is a period of great change in policing. And I think what has happened is that various people have articulated various concepts for how to change and how to move ahead. And in trying to describe those concepts, they've put a label on them by way of trying to give emphasis to what it is they're trying to achieve. So for example, in community policing, um, there's a whole, that, that embraces a whole range of different changes. Um, the primary emphasis, however, is on trying to deal with that old problem of developing a better relationship with the community and engaging with the community and everything else sort of builds around that. Uh, Problem-oriented policing is slightly different in that the emphasis in that uh, is upon uh, trying to deal more effectively and more uh, efficiently with uh, a wide range of the problems that the police confront. But each of these concepts embodies elements of the other. So within problem-oriented policing, you'll have some elements of community policing. And within community policing, there's a lot of emphasis on, on problem solving. From among the many things that could be said about problem-oriented policing, what would you describe as the major distinction between traditional policing and problem-oriented policing? In traditional policing, the, uh, the, we start with the notion that police are engaged in law enforcement. As if uh, you know, that's the primary means by which they get the job done and the means come to define their goal. So everything focuses on law enforcement, on the use of the criminal law, and, um, and uh, whatever they, else they do, is whatever they do beyond just enforcing the criminal law is done through the use of the criminal law. Um, so it, it perverts and abuses uh, the, the law to some extent in order to get the job done. Uh, in contrast with that, if, when we talk about problem-oriented policing, we're more forthright, more candid, and starting with the notion that the job of the police is to deal with a wide range of problems. And then we proceed from that by trying to analyze each problem uh, in a very systematic sort of way. And as a result of that analysis, try to come up with a custom-made response to that particular problem. That response might consist of several different elements, only one of which is the use of the criminal law. So it puts the criminal law and law enforcement uh, in context, and it invites the police to make use of a broad range of other alternatives that in the end might be much more effective in dealing with the problem. So you would say that it teaches police officers to be actually more proactive in dealing with the problem than being reactive Exactly, Theo. That's a ma another major element and you know, that would compete uh, if, if we were to prioritize these distinctions. Uh, and that is that much of current uh, traditional policing is reactive, just waiting for something to happen and reacting to it, primarily with the judgment, has a law been broken, has it not, and if not, and if it has, what can we do about it? 
Uh, in contrast, uh, problem-oriented policing is, is much more proactive in the sense that it commits the police to analyzing uh, their regular business, their regular workload, and trying to come up with creative ways in which to deal with that. Mark, your question? You wrote your book on problem-oriented policing about eight years ago. What's happened to the concept since that time? Well, a great deal. Uh, but it's very, very hard to, to quantify it or to characterize it because I've learned that when you float an idea that is that broad uh, in, a, in, in a country as large as this with as many police agencies as we have and also abroad, that you get great variations in response to it. There's been a lot of activity. Some departments are operating with a primary emphasis in problem oriented policing and is totally uh, redesign, uh, it, it's resulted in, in a redesign of the way in which they police. Uh, other departments have not done that, but individual officers within the department uh, have uh, taken the initiative and have engaged in problem oriented policing. Uh, and so um, the, the pattern is very uneven, uh, it's not a very neat pattern. Uh, but each year when we have this annual conference uh, out in San Diego bringing together people who've worked in this area, uh, we are always impressed by uh, the numbers of individuals who have, uh, are engaged in the process and who have something to uh, report to the police uh, all around the country. Moreover, as I indicated earlier, in the overlap <coughs> between problem-oriented policing and community policing, a problem, problem solving has become a very uh, major element uh, uh, within the broader efforts at community policing and so you see, you see it reflected in that around the country. Theo, do you have another question? Uh, professor, can you give us an example of a Wisconsin agency that has embraced your problem-oriented policing philosophy? Well, there are num uh, reflecting what I've just said about the country, there are a number of agencies in the state that have uh, made use of the concept. Uh, I think it's, it's difficult to pin any one agency down and say that that's an agency that's operating entirely with a problem-solving sort of a mode. Um, but we've had lots of very good examples. Uh, and indeed, the La Crosse Department uh, uh, won one of the national awards for a specific uh, problem-solving effort. Uh, relating to their handling of the annual uh, disorders that were associated with the, uh, with the uh, Coon Creek uh, race. Um, and the reason they won that award was on studying it uh, very intensely uh, and committed to coming up with a more effective response. They did so um, by incorporating a whole range of efforts in addition to just being prepared to arrest people. And, uh, it was successful in that it greatly reduced the amount of disorder associated with that event. There are other departments in the state that have adapted it uh, with regard to specific uh, traffic problems. And here again in a variety of ways. So for example, here in Madison, uh, within the department, they've had a number of experiences over the years in which they've tried to deal with recurring problems uh, through analysis and a more custom-made response. Uh, the problem of cruising on West Washington Avenue was uh, dealt with more creatively, uh, not just by focusing on enforcement, but on some changes, uh, some physical changes, including the re-signing of the street to regulate the amount of parking, which in turn uh, reduced the, the um, numbers of uh, bystanders. And there were some other as elements associated with that uh, project. Um, Madison also several years ago dealt with a speeding problem on Monroe Street by engaging the community uh, in, uh, in alerting speak speeders to their, to their speed and then having members of the community talk with uh, those people who were stopped in addition to the police talking to them so that the community expressed their views as to why it was essential that drivers uh, reduce their speed. And one of the more uh, interesting uh, problem-solving efforts, which I don't think the people involved would identify as su such, but from an outside uh, perspective, it, it's, it's a very neat sort of problem-solving effort. And that is the effort that was initiated by the community uh, on uh, the Johnson Street corridor to keep speeding at uh, 25 miles per hour through a major community initiative, which in that case uh, had the support of the police department. Uh, but the police were not the prime movers in getting that going. So those are some of the examples that I would cite. So by the police taking a proactive approach in that manner, the community sees fit where they can also 
put forth some problem-oriented policing or just problem-oriented uh, 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 way of uh, dealing with a problem in their area too. Well, I, th I think it's, and here we, we identify one of the connections between the problem solving and the community solving effort, uh, the community policing efforts. And that is that um, the problem solving is a sort of a neutral concept. And once the police start doing that, uh, it's important also to engage the community in doing that because ultimately our desire is to empower the community and get the community to do more things for themselves. Uh, and indeed, in, uh, in a major effort that was launched down in Chicago, Chicago Police Department, after a period of time, initiated a major program to teach community groups problem solving so that they were the ones who were initiating the effort with the police, rather than taking a lead role, playing a more uh, supportive role. And I see more and more of that happening around the country, and that's all for the good. Denise? You write about the SARA problem solving model in your book. Would you describe what SARA stands for? Right. Well, SARA was not my, uh, I did not initiate that term. I uh, identified the concept and then I think in a very helpful sort of way, others came around and gave it a title that created an acronym that has caught on to the point where uh, SARA is now well established in policing all around this country. Um, what I had identified was the need to systematically identify problems in depth, uh, to study those problems again in depth, uh, and then to, uh, to come up with uh, tailor-made solutions to those problems as the third step, and finally to evaluate the results to make sure that what you put in place is an improvement, is working, is better than what you had there before. Uh, beginning with the first experimentation along these lines, now more than a decade ago, when it was implemented in Newport News, they um, renamed those as, uh, as the SARA model, and I think stands for uh, scanning, uh, uh, analysis, response, and assessment. And essentially that's the description of those four things. And it has made it easier for police to use it, because as you know in policing, we like to use uh, acronyms. And, um, so now police will talk about the fact that they sarahed the problem, and, uh, and it serves a very useful purpose. I worry sometimes that it, uh, it makes the process uh, too mechanical and, 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 and not involving as much thinking as should go into it. So it scares me a little bit, but to the extent that it's a little bit of a crutch that we can depend upon to remember the, the importance of going through these four stages, I think on balance it served a very useful purpose. In what way does it involve the community? Well, I would, I would go back to the, one of the examples I cited earlier, and that is upon analyzing a problem, it very often turns out that the police, while they can come up with the, uh, a potential solution, a, a suggestion for improving a response, it's not always the police that are in a position to implement it. That implementation requires uh, some elements of the community to get involved. So if you're talking about uh, problems in apartment complexes, for example, uh, it requires that you involve landlords, it requires that you involve uh, tenants. Um, and if you talk about traffic problems, it requires that you involve um, drivers among many others. Uh, and so at the end of these analyses, when you are coming up with new solutions, you come to realize that there are different actors that have to be brought into the process and that they have to be encouraged to, to contribute their portion. And I, I think it's fair to say that one of the difficulties, we, one of the things that has surfaced as a result of the large number of problem-solving efforts that have been made here in this con in country and abroad is that the police are very good at identifying new responses, but very often they are not in the position to implement themsel it themselves or they would be totally overwhelmed. They have to identify it, they have to broker the response to somebody else, and then go on to doing other things. And I think one of the current, um, the cutting edge issues in problem solving, um, to which I've been giving a lot of attention recently, is what we can do uh, to, uh, along the lines of doing more to broker the responses that the police come up with and have others assume responsibility for that, 
for them so that police can get back to doing some of their basic functions and, um, and um, others are involved in actually the implementing the responses. Mark, next question. Professor Goldstein, do you see the problem-oriented policing approach as being cost-effective? Well, I, I, I think that's one of the strongest uh, cases that could be made for it in the sense that in traditional policing, uh, police often in a very unthinking way uh, just respond to the same problem over and over and over and over again with a feeling of impotence, with a feeling that there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, and we have documented cases of police going back to the same location. Uh, hundreds of times, uh, each time being no more effective than they were the previous time. To the extent that we uh, incorporate as a part of the mindset of policing, the, 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 the a commitment once you have seen a problem once, twice, and three times, to say there's something going on here that needs a, more di a different kind of response, and to be equipped to identify it in, uh, a, and, and then move into an analysis stage so that something can be done on a more permanent basis to deal with the, the cause factors so that the problem can be eliminated or at least modified or reduced. And if that's the case, it is very cost effective because it greatly reduces the demands made on the police and makes their time available for other kinds of things. Um, it saves um, manpower in, 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 in the end. And I, th I think that is showing up in a lot of the experiments that are going on. Moreover, um, not only is it cost effective, but the individual officer who has to return to the same incident over and over and over again gets highly frustrated and feels a lack of, of accomplishment in his or her work. And uh, the opportunity to do something more constructive, more creative, uh, in order to deal with the problem more permanently is a source of enormous uh, in, increase in, in satisfaction on the part of the officers in getting the job done. Theo, do you have another question? Uh, for problem-oriented policing to be a success, what changes do you see fit are required in a police agency uh, to promote this philosophy? Many. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that you can just uh, decide on a Sunday that you're going to implement it on a Monday and, and you have an injection in which you just say, okay, as of now, everybody's working along these lines. It requires lots of planning. It requires changing mindsets, uh, weaning people away from attitudes and approaches to the policing job that have been in place for years. Um, it requires changes in recruit, the recruit, recruitment, the time, type of officers we bring into policing. Uh, it requires changing in training uh, so that police are not trained to act as robots, but rather as thinking of officers who are paid, compensated, encouraged uh, to reflect on what they're doing and how they might be able to do it better. It uh, requires changes in the reward system within police departments. It requires changes in supervision. So a supervisor is not just somebody who controls the subordinates and makes sure that they show up for work and do what the manual requires, but it makes out of the supervisor a coach who, who uh, is there to help the officers in engaging in these problem-solving efforts. And it requires extraordinarily strong leadership on the part of police administrators so that they uh, can explain why this approach has value um, in the long run for strengthening the, the quality of policing. So what you're saying is that it would be imperative that everyone in the department be trained in this philosophy instead of just a few people working here and then everybody else doing something else. It wouldn't be effective that way. Yes, and the big, one of the big errors that is currently made is that uh, some departments will say, well, we're now going to have this unit that will be problem solving and everybody else will go about doing their job as they did uh, in the old days. Uh, that hardly ever works. Um, it isolates uh, the, the, the effort. It uh, almost defines it inherently as peripheral to the regular job. It reinforces the notion that real policing consists of what we've always done, and this is some you know, modern notion that we're going to give a little effort to. 
so the departments that have been most effective along those lines are those that, that have said, this is, is something we're going to do with a department-wide uh, change in our orientation, in our perspective, in our approach. Uh, it would be much like the revolution that occurred in medicine from just you know, doctors responding when somebody became ill to medicine placing primary emphasis on prevention and trying to get at the cause of the headaches rather than just treat the headache. And uh, that kind, that change is radical. And when you have radical change of this nature, uh, it's important that everybody be on the same wavelength, be supportive, and that it permeate the organization. Denise, I think we have time for one more question. How can management create a supportive environment for officers to use their street knowledge to create a safer community? Well, I think uh, they can do some of the things we've talked about in the way of uh, you know, the changes that have to occur in recruitment and training, in what they reward in the, way, in the department, in what they look for from, uh, from supervisors. But I think the, one of them, and they have to provide the means by which departments can analyze problems and not see that as a frivolous sort of thing, but as central to, to getting the job done. That is, uh, I don't think it's illegitimate. I think it's very, very legitimate for a police department to have a research unit that is looking systematically on, uh, on the, the quality of effectiveness of what they're doing. And uh, unfortunately, in some quarters, that's considered to be a frill that we can afford only if we've got nobody, uh, uh, or if, if, if we don't have to get everybody out on the street. Um, but beyond that, one of the most important things management has to do is to re redefine the job of, a police, of the police officer himself, herself. Uh, from uh, being the, inf uh, the law enforcer, being the person who just issues tickets, being the person who is, uh, whose success is based upon arrest, and being the person who, uh, in a mechanical sort of way, just gets the job done. We want to change the atmosphere of police departments so that individual officers are recognized for having the talent and the ability and the resourcefulness that they generally have. If, on the other hand, uh, management creates an atmosphere uh, that is supportive of uh, innovation, um, that trusts officers, that's more important than anything else, that, t that treats police officers not as uh, children, uh, you know, to be uh, controlled, but tr treats them with respect as individuals who have something to contribute to the organization. That that kind of, and gives them a license with which to function that takes them outside of the usual perimeters that define their role, that that uh, has the potential for uh, uh, getting a much, much higher return on the investment we make in police officers. Uh, and ultimately has the potential for making the agency overall much, much more effective in, in getting the job done. Professor Goldstein, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, I think it's, it's worth noting that our focus uh, here today has been on not just thinking about problem-oriented policing, but thinking about its application to traffic problems. And I, I, uh, I think it's right to, to note that there's a much more solid basis upon which to build in the traffic area than there is with reg than there has been with regard to many of the other aspects of what police do, uh, and the progress has been realized over the years. We've been much more methodical in thinking about what we're doing about traffic, uh, and through uh, through analysis, uh, distribution of police resources has been made based largely on the number of crashes that occur and uh, where they occur and some of the factors that have, that have contributed to them. And that has, in turn, influenced the, the decisions that police departments have made in, in deciding how many officers to, to uh, assign to traffic and where to assign them and where traffic enforcement is to take place, et cetera. So there's more of an analytical component that has been built into that aspect of police functioning than into many other aspects of policing. And, uh, and uh, therefore, I, I feel that uh, there's more to build on there. And I would, uh, in looking down the line, expect that the application of problem solving uh, to that aspect of the police job that relates to traffic uh, would produce uh, more positive results than in a lot of other areas and, and much sooner. Well, thank you, Professor Goldstein. Thank you, panel.
and thank you for watching.